And he's actually chosen by God to tell people to turn from their sins or else. And God actually told him, no one's going to listen to you. So good luck. <laughs> oh. so Today we're doing the book of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Thank you, Betsy. The weeping prophet. Does he like to weep? He, Does he like to make people weep? He did both. Did Gap write his own notes? Jeremiah had a hard had a hard life. Jeremiah had a hard road as a prophet. Um, but he uh, was faithful and he got to get to see some of his prophecy come true, which was when you're a judgment prophet and telling about bad things going to happen wouldn't have been that fun. But he's actually chosen by God to tell people to turn from their sins or else, and God actually told him, no one's going to listen to you. So good luck. <laughs> oh, so he knew his whole life from a young man. I... You know what? We could almost start by just reading the first chapter. It's actually really good. Um, get Jeremiah open. I, I think it, it's a great summary of... It, it tells you a really good picture of Jeremiah's life. It's really, really amazing. All right, Jeremiah 1. There, these are the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkah, one of the priests from the town of Anathoth, Anthaloth, in the land of Benjamin, the Lord first gave messages to Jeremiah during the 13th reign of Joash, son of Ammon, king of Judah. The Lord, here's your paper. The Lord's messengers continued throughout the reign of jo King Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, until the 11th year of the reign of King Zedekiah, another one of Josiah's sons. In August of that 11th year, the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. So almost like a whole summary of the book right there. Well, who's our author? In August. Mine says the fifth month. The fifth month. Um, yeah, so the fifth. Yeah, their first month was like March. Yeah, their, the way their calendar is. So it's how the Bible chose to translate it. So Jeremiah was the author. There's also a scribe involved that's mentioned called Baruch, B A R U C H. Um, and it is the writings. This is interesting. It's not just poetic prophecy. There's actually three genres in here. Historical, poetic, and biographical. So you're hearing some of the life of... Uh, it's all based on the life of Jeremiah. So as far as genre... Isn't it prophetic too? Yes. And his, prof and his prophecy. So maybe four. <laughs> Historical, poetic... Um, there's a lot of poetry structure. The prophecy would be all poetic prophecy structure um, and biographical, too. Um, he, Josiah was... who Did did you catch who his dad... What, what his dad did? He was a priest. So what does that mean that jo, jo, uh, Jeremiah should have been? A priest. a priest. He's in the line of priests. He would have been grown up expecting to be a priest. Um, but early in his life, we're going to see... Um, I'm going to read the rest of this chapter. It tells how he got on the prophet path. Verse 4. The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart a point, and appointed you as prophet to the nations. So, mm -hmm. pro-life verse right People there. Really like that verse. But also appointed as a job. God had a job for Jeremiah before he was even born. Um, a point, what was his job to be? To be a priest? A prophet. No, to be a prophet. So a messenger from God. So uh, Jeremiah has a lot of visions and, and dreams where he's seeing um, where God is speaking to him, giving him messages. And this is the first one um, where God says, him, says this to them. And he, he replies, oh, so this is verse six. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. So we think Jeremiah was like 20 years old at this time. Um, 
And so he's like, I'm too young. I can't do it. You know, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Maybe you feel that way too. But, and then the Lord replies, don't say I'm too young for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people for I will be with you and I will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. I have spoken. Yeah. <laughs> Mandalorian. Uh, then the Lord reached out, touched my mouth and said, look, I have put words in your mouth. Today I appointed you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some must uproot, some you must uproot and tear down, others and overthrow, destroy and overthrow, others you must build up and plant. So literally Jeremiah's like, I'm too young, I can't do this. Um, and God's like, I'm putting words in your mouth. This is your job, this is your life. And I just think it's really interesting. I mean, we were even talking this morning about our missions trip and about like, they're gonna be sending us out to do evangelism and we're like, ah, oh, that's scary and stuff. Like, this is a great reminder. Like, we may feel we're too young. We may feel we don't have words. God, if he's sending you, he's gonna put words in your mouth and give you what you need, sending you. Awesome, yes. Just think that Jesus chose the disciples who were all young people too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They were chosen as God has use. He doesn't wait till you're old to use you, for sure. Um, let's see, verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, look, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch from an almond tree. And the Lord said, that's right. It means I'm going, that I'm watching. I will certainly carry out all my plans. What do you see now? So there's, there's a lot of, uh, what is this allegory? No, this is like metaphors, like pictures that, that he's seeing that, that have reasons. What? Imagery. Imagery, yeah. Um, there's an, so an, a branch from an almond tree. What can we pause? What else has an almond um, branch? Ooh. In, in, Aaron's staff. staff. So he's in the line of priests of Aaron. Right. This is specific. The almond branch was not an accidental choice. Yeah. I think Jeremiah would have absolutely known that he's referencing Aaron and, and his choosing of Aaron. And then he sees, what do you see now? I reply, I see a pot of boiling water spilling from the north. Yes, the Lord said, the, the for terror from the north will boil out on the people of this land. Listen, I'm calling out the armies of the kingdoms of the north to come to Jerusalem. I, the Lord, have spoken. We'll stop there. So the, Jeremiah has this message of prophecy of the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem. And he actually gets to, to live to see it. Jeremiah lives through five different kings. They all have J names. It is quite oh, no, a while. One is Zedekiah. Yeah, the end one. So the audience are... This is a very specific audience. God gave Jeremiah a message and an audience to speak it to. It'd be the people of Israel and also the kings of Judah because they're the leaders. He would have been based in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. Um, it's it said that he was born, you know, next to Judah in the tribe of Benjamin, right? Or no, in Bethlehem. What does it say? No, in the tribe and land of Beth Benjamin. So next to Judah, and then he was based in Jerusalem. Um, mainly, and then actually bad stuff happens to him and he goes other places, but we'll get to that. Is that why Egypt is listed at yeah. one of the places? Yes, he gets he gets kidnapped, no, not kidnapped, but arrested and sent to, to Egypt. Um, he has a terrible life, this poor guy. This is why he's the weeping prophet. Basically, God says, I have a, a bad message for you of destruction to give to the people, and no one's going to listen to you, and you're going to have a really hard life, and I don't want you to get married, I don't, um, or, or anything like, this is your life, Jeremiah. And he's like, okay, here we go. From a young age. So, you can feel bad for Jeremiah, but also he was doing what the but Lord like, wanted him to do. when you are obeying God, yeah. that is a great feeling. I'm sure it's discouraging. It still hurts like, when they beat you up and throw you in a pit and all the yeah. terrible stuff that happens. But you, you, you know there's yes. a better choice than disobeying God. Because you know what happened to, um, you know, know. When he got swallowed by the whale. Jonah, yeah. Jonah would be an example of if, if Jeremiah had run away from this job, what may have happened to him? So yeah, during the last five kings, so Josiah, of, of this is the southern kingdom kings, Josiah, Jehoiaz, yes. Um, Jehoiakim, Je, Je, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. So these are the last five kings. Um, and... 627 to 586 BC. So he starts prophesying first um, that Assyria is coming. That's the kingdom from the north. That's the pot of boiling water. And the whole story of them, they conquer the northern kingdoms. And then 
um, and then prophesying about Babylon coming and conquering Israel. So to remember, time period, we've kind of looked at the whole history of the Old Testament. Um, we've kind of been through the historical books. Now we're in the major prophets and then the minor prophets. Just major means big books. This is another big book. It's 50-some chapters, 52. Um, and then we're going to look at the minor prophets, which are just short prophets. But they are all prophets during the kings and during the events of the history we've already looked at. So we're not covering new history. We've already talked about the fall of Jerusalem, um, Babylon coming. We've talked about the fall of the northern kingdom by Assyria. So this is the time that Jeremiah is prophesying. Prophesying these events that have not happened, but yet happen. And that's the mark of a prophet, right? That he speaks of the future, that his words are true because some things happen. So if he can speak to the true, speak to the future events, he's speaking for God and foretelling events from God. Yes. So this is before they got taken over, right? Yes. So why would like some of the other books that happen after this, why is it in this order? So it's, it's arranged by category, not chronology, not in order of time. So we looked at, you know, the Torah, which is the first five books, and those are chronological. And then we looked at basically the historical books. So we had all the history books, the first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. And then even into Esther and, um, oh, oh the, even the Nebuchadnezzar, Nehemiah and Ezra. Those are all historical, right? So those followed the first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles followed all the king time. And then that ended with the, uh, whatever, when they get taken. <laughs> when they get captured by the Babylonians. Conquered by the Babylonians, taken over to Babylon. And then we have Esther, which happens over there. But you also have Daniel, which happened then. But Daniel, it could have been placed then in the timeline, but it actually is a prophetic book, so it's with the section of the books of poetry. Right, so like Psalms, of pro Job, prophecy. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Yeah. Though that's a chunk of literature. So and that's poetic books. Right? And now we're into the prophetic books, yeah, all the Isaiah, books of Jeremiah, prophecy. But Lamentations comes next. Lamentations is, is prophet, Jeremiah's prophet. book too. But is it prophecy? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, Joel, Amos, Obed, yeah, it's, 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 it's prophecy. It's lamenting for the fall the of Jerusalem. So the fall. That's the word I was looking for. The fall of Jerusalem. Oh, like anyway, so does that make sense? It's not historically chronology I'm laid sure out. You can get a Bible it's categories. that rearranges it for you. I think I want one. Yeah, I have a chronological Bible. It's pretty cool. I'm just going to have a bunch of Bibles. They're all going to be a different week of Christmas. Bibles? Bibles. There's so many Bibles that oh, resources that are awesome. Thank you. Um, Harley, Harley, Gospel, gonna be my he had a Bible of the Month Club for a while. Yeah, I was buying a different cool Bible every month. Oh, it was God, super awesome. So yeah. I think it's the best Bible subscription, subscription ever. ever. I need more money. Um, okay, main characters. <laughs> Jeremiah. Yeah. He's supposed to be a priest, but he becomes a prophet. Um, he, the five kings are main characters because he's prophesying to them. They're kind of making decisions. Remember, there's some good kings in here. Some good kings that, that turn the corner. I feel like Jeremiah like is a classic example of the guy who's supposed to take over the family business, but he's like, actually, I've got a different job. Yeah, you could probably imagine some disappointment from his father. He's like, you know, I thought you were going to be in the family business and probably train to be a priest. And then, uh, actually, God wants me to go to this. And I mean, there's not going to be any grandkids either, sorry. So I'm not getting married. So uh, he kind of had a sad, from, like we're talking about, from worldly perspective, difficult life, but he was where God wanted him to be. Um, so, and then we got Baruch the scribe. He's in there too. And he's helping. To, Thanks, Baruch. He, you know, God calls him to write this down, and Baruch writes this down for him. So a scribe is not necessarily an author, right? Does that make sense? A scribe is like, like different it's people like wrote editor. it for Paul. It's like more like an editor and, and writer, right? But there's, there's likely Baruch added some, as an editor, added some details and filled some things in too. There's different thoughts on that. All right, what is the purpose of this book? Any guesses? You guys should go uh, first. Stop it! People to turn from their sin. I'll stop. As a prophet, yes, he is trying to get people to turn from their sins and turn back to God. Now, Jeremiah already knew that they wouldn't, so it's kind of rough. But, but actually, some of, the, some of the kings do, right? Some of the kings, Josiah, 
Um, some of the kings make good, good turns, and make, but the judgment is still coming. Um, well, I feel that sometimes when, when people actually re respond, God just delays his yes. judgment. And that's what happened too. That's why the southern kingdom did not get conquered with the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom. But once kingdom. God has decided... It, it God delayed. Happen. God delayed that. And we see that multiple times in the Old Testament. Who else was it where he was like, okay, it won't happen in your lifetime because you were such a good leader? Yeah. Uh, Josiah. Saul. Moses. Saul. Moses. Uh, no. Moses. Well, there was Moses. Solomon. Yeah, Solomon. Until the end of his life, he's like, you're not going to lose the kingdom, but your yes. son will. Yes. And that's yes. when the kingdom divided. Yeah, I feel like we, there's more than obviously Josiah, kind of right? It was the king. But he Josiah actually did that because of like David. It was, yeah. it was one of the kings who said Hezekiah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. See, but we had multiple examples already. Hezekiah right here. stood oh, off yeah. the Assyrian invasion, and remember the tunnel we went in? Like they were sieged by the Assyrians, which took the northern kingdom for a long time. But he sought after God and and had some alliances that like helped him. Anyway. Anyways, it's interesting to say like. You can, sometimes God's timing will be different, but his ultimate will will still be. Um, All right, still let's go through the outline real quickly. So we've got oh, chapter please. one. Oh, quickly. God, so there's kind of two sections to this book. Oh. Section A is God's judgment on Judah, okay? So this specifically to the southern kingdom about what is going to happen to them. God is pouring out his judgment. So it's a many chapters of God's judgment and prediction of the future through prophecy through Jeremiah. So that whole 1 through 45 is all God's judgment on Judah. The second big section is actually God's judgment on the nations. So it's very interesting, what right? What do you mean by nations? So all the other countries, okay. uh, the rest of the world. Um, why, you know, like this is God's people, right? Judah is God's people. Israel is God's people. So why would he use even more evil people to conquer them and punish them? Doesn't that seem kind of weird? Like, like it doesn't seem fair. Like, at least Israel is kind of trying to, like, worship God. All these other nations are absolutely not trying to worship God, but God uses and gives favor to these other nations. So it's actually kind of, the second section is, about what God is going to do to the other nations as well and punishing them. But he's, God can use evil people for his purposes. And this is a difficult, this is like speaks into why does good things happen to bad people, right? But, like, it, also, but it also speaks to like no power is, is, is there on earth except for appointed by God. And that power may be a bad power. Yeah. But God is still God using... uses evil rulers, like he used Nebuchadnezzar, you know, like to invade and, and conquer. But it was his purpose, right? Uh, so chapter number one is the call of Jeremiah. We read some of that. Section two, verse chapters two through ten, Jeremiah condemns Judah for her sins. So he's going through their many sins, their many things they've done wrong. Um, here in chapter, Jeremiah's weeping. He's weeping in 419. My heart, my heart, I writhe in pain. My heart pounds within me. I cannot be still, for I've heard the blast of enemy trumpets, the war of their battle cries. So, you know, like, Jer Jeremiah didn't take joy in pro prophesying the destruction of his people. Like, this was hard for him too, right? He's seeing these terrible things that are happen happening. Uh, 22, my people are foolish and do not know me, says the Lord. They are stupid children who have no understanding. They are clever enough, to, to, they are clever enough at doing wrong, but they have no idea how to do what's right. And then Jeremiah has a vision of coming disaster. So there's, there's a lot of this. The, sin, the sins of Judah, a warning. It kind of goes back and forth. Like he lists the sins and then he has the warning um, for, and, and judgment for what's happening. You know, it's uh, Judah's constant rebellion. Judah rejects the Lord way, an invasion from the north. Um, Judah, Jeremiah speaks at the temple. So um, Judah's persistent idolatry. So these are just some of the headings. Weeping in Jerusalem. So here we keep, we've seen weeping a few times. This is why he's the weeping prophet. All right, section 11 through 20, he prophesies the destruction. Um, and then uh, in 21 through 29, he specifically prophesies to the leaders. So this would be the kings and the leaders and the priests and, and people who are leading the people in, in bad directions. Um, oh, by the way, in 16, this is where Jeremiah is forbidden to marry. 
I found this interesting. The Lord gave me another message. He said, do not get married or have children in this place. For this is what the Lord says about the children born here in the city and their mothers and fathers. They will die from terrible diseases. No one will mourn for them or bury them. They'll be scattered on the ground like manure. They will die from worm and famine. Their bodies will be food for vultures and wild animals. So he tells Jeremiah, don't get married because there's just destruction coming. Well, he said don't get married in this place. Oh. Does that mean that maybe he could get married elsewhere? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think he does, so... Um, but there's, you know, th here's another picture of Jeremiah's faith in the Lord, even though he's ter all these terrible things. In chapter 16, Jeremiah's prayer of confidence. Lord, you are my strength and fortress, my refuge. This is actually, I've heard this before. This is popular. My refuge in the day of trouble. Nations from around the world will come to you and say, our ancestors left us a foolish heritage for they worshiped worthless idols. Can a people make their own God? These are not real gods at all. And then the Lord says, now I'll show them my power, I'll show them my might. At last they can know and understand that I am the Lord. But, you know, through all this difficulty, Jeremiah's character is actually pretty strong. You are my strength and fortress, my refuge, right? Um, Jeremiah's trust in the Lord. Okay, so 21 through 29, accusations of Judah's leaders. And then in chapter 30 to 33, restoration is promised. So there is still hope for for um, promises of deliverance. So he also prophesies things outside his lifetime where they're going to be um, restored, brought back, Rachel's sadness, turned to joy, hope for restoration. Um, and, and so there's three chapters of that. And then it switches to historical a little bit, and then it, re it, it says the events. So this stuff starts happening. Um, so it starts to, to tell the history. Um, here's Baruch in 36, our scribe guy. Um, God's promised judgment arrives in 34 to 45. So we switch from prophecy to historical. And then, so then that stuff happens. Um, and then God's judgment on the nations, 46 to 52. So there's prophecies about the four nations, 46 to 49. God will judge Babylon specifically, right? Babylon is the nation that conquers Judah specifically. So that's Nebuchadnezzar. And then the fall of Jerusalem. Um, and then, so it wraps up the historical. And then it, it gives that same um, message of hope. So um, about Jehoiakim, remember, we talked about this at the end of 2 Kings, where a king in the line of David gets Nebuchadnezzar's like, hey, you're all right, come sit out yeah. at the table. And it actually is a message pointing towards David's line being um, held together, and there's still a future king, and then um, and that God is, still has his favor on David's line. And that's how the book ends. Okay, let's watch the Bible Project overview on it. That's what it's all about. So, Jeremiah, weeping prophet, I thought of something. Who else is thrown into a pit and then took into Daniel. Joseph. Joseph, and then taken to Egypt. I just not thrown into a pit. If you're curious, uh, in 38 is where Jeremiah gets thrown into a pit. Um, yeah, he probably cries in there. Where is it? Uh, verse 11. They took men with him, went to a room in the palace but beneath the treasury where he found some old rags and discarded clothing. He carried those to the cistern and lowered them. Oh, wait. No, that's where he's already in there. Where is it? It talks about the mud. So the officials... Oh, verse 6. So the officials took Jeremiah from his cell, lowered him by ropes into an empty cistern in the prison yard. It belonged to Milka, member of the royal family. There was no water in the cistern, but there was a thick layer of mud at the bottom. And Jeremiah like sank chosen. down into it. It's like in the chosen. Poor yeah. Jeremiah. Yeah. In the muddy pit. So, um, and then he got kidnapped and taken. Poor guy. So, but everyone was sick of hearing from him, right? Like all he's do, all Jeremiah's like, is talking about is like, you guys have sinned. God's going to send judgment to you. And they're just like so sick of hearing from him. They throw him in pits and kidnap him and send him to Egypt. But... I think he's a great example of faithfulness to God, even though he had a really hard job. Um, and 
that's pretty interesting and and he's a pretty good example of that but he also got to talk about hope right we saw the, the bible project brought that out in some good ways um chapters 31 th turn there chapter 31 has a, a cool pointing to jesus um with a new covenant 31 31 let's see let's see what it says the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the ones I made with their ancestors when I took them out, took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as husbands love his wife, as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. Um, yeah, so all the imagery they brought out. I think Jeremiah might have been the first, maybe not, to use um, the imagery of when Israel cheats on God, it's like adultery, a husband cheating on his wife or something, or a wife cheating on his husband. Um, but this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put instructions deep within them. I will write on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So it's a whole new covenant, I think, talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. And at one time, like, you won't have to become an Israelite to follow God. It, it'll be written on your hearts. Anyone can follow God. And everyone will know about Jesus. Um, well, not doesn't have the name of Jesus yet, but, but be able to know God and, and their sins will be forgiven. So... Does this, this book talk about Jesus? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, a bunch of pointing to a Messiah, to the hope of a Savior, a hope for all the nations, right? Not just for the people of Israel. This would have been crazy to the Israelites. They're like, wait, I mean, you know, it's, it's written in there like that you'll be a blessing to the nations, but they had no idea, right? They were like, we're, the, we're God's people. Everybody else, you don't matter. Um, so yeah, a new covenant point to Jesus. Uh, somebody pointed out that a weeping, he was a weeping prophet and Jesus wept too. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with, acquainted with grief, it says. Um, Jesus' Jesus's life wasn't easy either, um, but he was on God's path. It, there's a lot of lessons to be learned about that. Um, God's, God's path for you isn't always the easiest path, the path of least resistance. It may be a difficult path, but that's where God may want you. Um, and may bring you. So you can't just assume that, oh, if following God will be easy, and obeying God will just make my life perfectly easy. Yeah. Uh, key verse, 219. Let's look that up. Um, your wickedness will bring its own punishment. Your shame, your turning from me will shame you. You will see what an evil, bitter thing it is to abandon the Lord your God and not to fear him. I, the Lord... The Lord of heaven's armies have spoken. So it definitely spoke with power and authority, right? Like, wow. Like, he knew he was speaking for the Lord. Timeless truth. Last thing. What do you think? It's up there. Be faith I have. Be faithful to deliver the message. God changes the hearts. So like, right? Like, like Jeremiah's job. It was not expected that he would speak so well or so eloquently that everyone would believe him and follow because of what he said. Like, his job was just to deliver the message. And I think that's the same for us in sharing the gospel. Like, it's not our job to change people's hearts, and it's not our fault if we, like, didn't use big enough, fancy enough words or convincing enough arguments. Like, all, all we need to do is be faithful to share the truth, share God's message. And God's the one who changes the heart. God's the one who's orchestrating and working in lives. Like, we're just faithful to sharing the truth and sharing the message. That's our responsibility, to go and speak the words. Yes? I have one, too. It's God's path for you might not be the easiest one. That's a good one. That's a good one. God's path for you might not be the easiest. All right, that's the book of Jeremiah. And that's Poor, crying, weeping prophet Jeremiah. Poor guy. Thanks, everybody.